why don't we uh, why don't we get into it, Greg? Why don't we start talking a little bit about first of all, let, let we do a toast every week. I'm going to do a toast to to you and the WGA and just not just for the win, but for the perseverance that you showed and the solidarity that you showed and th- you pushed through it. So congratulations to you and all the writers and the union for for all the great work. So congratulations there. Thank you very much. Um yeah, it was the, the one of the weirdest things is that at the end of the day, it was a 148 day strike. It was the second longest strike in the history of the Writers Guild. And uh, when push came to shove, we did eight days of negotiating. The the studios just didn't want to negotiate. They decided to try to wait us out and to see if we'd break and do all that stuff. But once the CEOs realized that mm-hmm. the only way out was a deal, right? It took four days. <laughs> they showed up. It took four days. Right. Long days at the Writers Guild offices. They came to us. Hmm. Bob Iger, David Zaslav, uh, Disney came, Sarandos came, got in a room with Carol Lombardini and the AMPTP reps, and they got in a room with us, and it was four long days of making a deal. They made giant moves, and we made moves back, and we actually, you know, all the people who are like, lock yourself in a room and just, why don't they just lock themselves in a room and make a deal? Well, when the other person just says no and sits still... It doesn't matter how long you sit in the room. We sat in that room for all summer. And then we finally got to a point this week where they said, we are in real trouble. We have to get a deal. We'll come to you and work one out. And we went back and forth and we negotiated and we fought. And we got a deal that uh, was pretty incredible. I mean, the value, just the monetary value of the deal Mm. tripled because of the strike. Wow. Wow. So, I mean, what do strikes do? They tripled the value of our contract. Uh, they enshrined that writers' rooms are real things that exist. They got screenwriters guaranteed rewrites when they sell a movie. Um, they got us. We now get paid more when our shows are successful. Very so th- amazing. Your <laughs> what, show what is a more, novel yeah, concept. Amazing. Yeah. That's in our contract language. A showrunner is a writer. That's in our contract yeah. language. Um, you know, all sort of comedy variety gets paid in streaming now. The nice. same they get paid on TV, which for me was the thing that I that I was there to fight for. So um, we, you know, we got an incredible contract through the power of that strike and our strength and solidarity. So it, yeah, it it felt great. That's that's fantastic. So what was it? What was it you think that? Uh, and I don't know if this is if this is something you can you can even opine on. But what is it that that kind of pushed it? Over the edge, because you know you you get to a point, and I think a lot of us who are watching from the sides and supporting you and, and pushing hard and rooting every day and waiting for that news to come through, we all just are like, oh, what what is it going to take to make this happen? And and was it that we they were running out of content, or was it they were starting to see a direct impact on their business, or what do you think it was that kind of made them say, all right, we better sit down with these guys? I think it was a couple things combined. One is, and and some of these factors will actually still help SAG in their strike because they're still on strike. Mm-hmm. They haven't talked to the studios in 75 days. They have to sit down on Monday and start a deal. And you'll notice that just like us, now the CEOs are going to the SAG offices. Mm-hmm. No more meeting at the AMPTP because what was revealed in this whole thing is the AMPTP doesn't work. And Carol Lombardini and her team, they don't work. Mm-hmm. The CEOs had to come down, do it themselves, make a deal. And I think they've realized now that that, you know, um, that, that Carol system doesn't work. So for SAG, they're going to have to come down and make a deal too. I think what really pushed it for them was there was that big hubbub at the end of August where they sat with us. They did a meeting with us that blew up. They released a deal. Um, you know, they told us, like, take this deal. <laughs> and we said no because um, we had already been negotiating back and forth on it. And it was it did not have most of the things we said we had to have. And and from August 22nd until last week, they tried everything except negotiating. They mm-hmm. leaked the deal to the press. They started out putting out stories about how the CEOs were so good. They um, they started going through agencies and having agents call their clients and say, oh, you should take the deal. You should give in. They tried to break off showrunners and have mm-hmm. the showrunners say, we're sick of it. Just end the strike. None of And none of those things worked. They tried to bring daytime TV back, and we shut it down. Mm-hmm. They tried everything except negotiating, and I think you get to a point where you go, okay, the fall season starts very soon. A bunch of it's already lost. We're about, I'm about to have to do a quarter three earnings report. Right. Um, like we were really up against it. And so we had been in conversation with some of these CEOs for weeks and weeks where they had said, we need to get a deal. The problem with the AMPTP model is there are these eight head companies and they have to be unanimous. 
So it doesn't matter if six or seven of them are like, let's go get a deal. If one giant tech company in the back goes, no, mm. it kills it. And right. so they ran into their, their own model is now hurting them in these negotiations. And once they were able to kind of step in on a CEO level and say, well, no, we're dragging these companies with us and get us to a deal, we were able to make something happen. That's great. And so as as fans uh, who've been watching this, what is what's sort of the immediate impact that that fans will will get as a result of this of course still waiting clearly for sag to to get their rightful deal as well but what's what's the what's the initial impact well i think you're going to see writing start now so um that means that projects that were in progress that paused or projects that had not yet started whatever those are those are going to get going really quickly probably on monday a bunch of writers rooms will be open Late night shows will be back this weekend. I mean, um, so everybody is ready to get going and to get working. So you're going to see a lot of writing happening too because as well, we kind of want to write because when SAG gets going, we need stuff for them to do. Everybody's going to need to get back to work. Mm -hmm. So we need to have stuff ready for SAG um, at the same time that we're supporting them. But I think the other thing that's going to change, and I, it was interesting, I was, I was thinking about this as we got the deal, is I do think, especially for Star Wars fans, the model of how the shows have been made has now been significantly impacted by this new contract. Mm. And and I, I'll lay it out. If I can dive into the kind of what we won and how it yeah. impacts it for a second. Because sure. um, there's a lot of technical language and people don't know, you know, don't know what's going on. But but with our root with the room size thing and the showrunner thing, a showrunner is now the head writer or the top writer in charge. Before mm. this the showrunner was not determined. Was not defined in any contract language. So on some shows, like Marvel shows, mm -hmm. the showrunner was an executive, okay. and then the person we would think of as a showrunner was just the head writer, and so that power was kind of separated. Now the showrunner is the writer that makes the hiring and firing decisions. Oh, in our contract, it says that. Right. Um, so so that changes how some of these shows work because all those people have a little bit more. They are officially the showrunner. Um, and that, what does that mean in a business meeting? I don't, I'm not sure, but it is more power than saying, I'm just here as the head writer. This guy's the showrunner. Right. Um, but the other big thing is, you know, we talked about minimum room sizes and staffing sizes and how TV is a communal medium. And um, basically, there are, it's going to change how these rooms look. Because if you put together a mini room, a mini room is before episodes are greenlit. When we're mm -hmm. thinking about making the show, we get a couple writers together and we start working out the season. We break the story. We break the characters. We come up with the whole season. And now that used to be done during the show or in the pilot. Now it's done in a mini room before you've even greenlit the show. Because for an executive, it's easier for me to look at like six scripts mm -hmm. and go, or it's cheaper to look at six scripts and go, what will this be than to shoot a pilot? Right. A pilot is $3 million. Yeah. Yeah. And a, a mini room is a million dollars. Okay, I saved two million dollars. So there's a lot of mini rooms. And the problem was that they were really short. They didn't pay well. They never led to a show, so you didn't get credits. Now a mini room is 10 weeks long, guaranteed. 10 guaranteed weeks of pay. Also, if there's a mini room, you get paid 25% more for being in the room because you're breaking story. You're doing the hard part of coming up with it. And if there's a mini room, there then has to be a writer's room. Right. And, and so that will change things as well because um, in a lot of models that we've seen these shows put together, it, you know, there's a lot of models that we've seen where, like, somebody writes it by themselves or that you do a mini room and then, so, no, there's never a writer's room and one guy just kind of writes the script or farms them out. Unless one person is writing everything, like Dave Filoni is doing with Ahsoka. Dave didn't do a mini room. He broke it all in his head because he knows the Rebels. Right. He wrote every episode himself. Cool. That would not change. Right. But the way that you'd write Mando, or the way you'd write Andor, or the way you'd write all these things, like these things, it might not even change who the writers were, but what's going to change is that there's now a writing room where those writers are getting paid for a certain amount of time, and two of those writers are guaranteed to be on set there when you you're go. shooting yeah. the show, yeah. which, I th which I think is incredibly helpful because in these big budget shows like a Marvel show or a Star Wars show, if you're the showrunner, you are doing so much, you're so busy. Right. And now you have two spots. One of them can be for a senior writer who's your friend and your buddy and is helping you take care of stuff. And the other one you can rotate writers through so the person who wrote that episode can come be on set right. 
and and be there and there that also means that writer's getting experience on set on a giant production so it's changed so much of this where you cannot just kind of have one person dink and dunk it and freelance all the scripts out you're gonna now with these shows you know the big ip shows the marvel shows, star wars shows if we do an indiana jones show there's gonna be a room there's right. gonna be a writer's room with writers in it kicking around ideas and and working on that, and so that's going to be a big change, I think, for that and for and I just use those as an example that we know of, right? You know, well, um, I, I think based on what you what I've learned from talking to you, you know, before the strike and during the strike uh, on a regular basis, and thank you so much from me and the people who listen to our show to to keep us in the loop so we understand it. Otherwise, and I think that's part of the challenge with any of these things is is telling this in a way that people care about and understand. But what I've learned the most is I think what has happened in the streaming world that we live in is the objective is is content quantity versus quality writing and so the mini room model which i didn't understand until you explained it to me it makes sense if i if i'm trying to cut corners and if i'm trying to produce as much content as much as many series as i can to keep up with netflix and then amazon and whatever um it makes sense that you're not you're you're not dedicating to the show like i think the all the great all the great television we've ever seen has had dedicated writers and people who are who are with the show for much longer than just you know busting out one or two episodes so i think if i'm hearing you right that is now in contract to make sure we're going to get that kind of writing yeah because i i think there is going to be a contraction i think contraction is going to be a big word that comes out and not because of the strike or even our new contract. It's it, you're like you said that model. Nobody. What people are finding out is no one wants that model. There are <laughs> 600 TV shows made a year, and that's what leads a little bit to everyone being like, I don't know what to watch. I don't know what's on. I don't know where it is because that's double what the number used to be. Right. And I say that not because I want there to be less writers working, but we do need those jobs to be good, sustainable jobs. And so I think what you'll start seeing is there'll be less shows with longer episodes going out there and what's great about this model change is that um almost every television show you've loved has had a room right it's had a bunch of writers sometimes only three or four but a, a group of writers all thinking together making a communal voice cheers was like that lost was like that twin peaks was you know i mean that he was writing most of that himself uh you know but like but these even curb is collaborative like these shows um, are are written with a room of different people, and that's not to say that the shows we've already gotten in Star Wars are great. But like, look, Bo Willeman wrote and Tony wrote on Andor, and mm -hmm. like, there are three or four people writing on Andor. That's a room. That's a writer's room. But now there's a secure. We've secured for that a place where it's like now you guys have a paid space to do that work. You're not getting sent out freelance. You're not getting lowballed on the script, and you also are making sure you get to get on set. And I think because I know some places already had rooms, like the Acolyte had a room. You know, like there's there's places. But now it isn't up to a showrunner who might not be that powerful. I mean, if I sell a show and I make it, I'm the showrunner. I mean, you guys have met me. It's like I don't have power to do anything. <laughs> so if I come to them, and this is the issue, what we had before was you said, well, I need like four writers. And they said, no, you can have one. Hmm. And you know it takes four writers, but you had one. Now there's there's at least a floor. It doesn't have to be the ceiling. You can have more writers than this. Yeah. But a six episode i'm sorry i'm getting so into this i just no, like we want it no, and i want to <laughs> so just so you can think because i think a lot of people are there th they think about the writing and stuff so a six episode show has three writers including the showrunner okay seven to twelve up also only 10 percent of shows made last year were that small almost mm -hmm. nothing is that small seven to twelve you have five writers including the showrunner mm -hmm. over 12 13 or up you have six writers including the showrunner and that's 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 what the numbers are now. Mm. So now it is if if you have a show like, you know, Last of Us already moved to a writers' room in season two before this even went into effect, mm. you know, or like if you want like and and this and what it comes down to is and I know people will think about this as well as like well, what about what Mike White? What about Taylor Sheridan? What about these people? Some of those people don't actually write all the shows themselves, and they ask their script coordinators to do it, and they don't give them credit. I won't say which one that person is, but they do like denim. Uh, <laughs> And they uh, and and but but the thing is, is like if one person is hired to do all the writing, they can write it by themselves. But like you were talking about, like like you were saying about there being less shows and and, and stuff, and we were talking yeah. about it being longer. Maybe I can write six by myself. Right? Can I write twelve? 
or 16 by myself? Do I want to do that? Yeah. I don't think I want to. I think I want a staff where I can be like, all of you are writing first drafts, yep. and I'll come in as the showrunner, and I'll take all the credit, and I'll punch them up. You know, <laughs> that's what a showrunner does. Right, yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. So, I, I, and again, thank you so much for, for coming in and giving us some time. I know you got uh, you have some, some final steps to do, and you get some some traveling to take care of. What does this mean for SAG, do you think? How close are we to getting sort of back to business as usual? Because with SAG on strike, you guys can write all the best stuff in the world, but those guys still can't get in front of the camera. So, Yeah, I think, um, I think there are two versions of... I guess I would say is I see two possible ways it goes. Mm -hmm. One is that the AMP the, the CEOs are really frustrated with the AMPTP model. They've seen that Carol and the gang can't get the job done. They already have had to make gives and they're and, and they feel the pressure of time and the holidays and everything. And they go, Okay, fine, we're also gonna give you big gives. I mean the AI situation for actors is so different than us because like yeah. when you're talking about my script I sold the script to the company. Mm -hmm. Like I sold them my script and they have the copyright and I don't. So what right. we can do, what you can do with my script is different, but a studio doesn't have a copyright to your face. Mm -hmm. And so um, what they need with AI and what's going to happen is so up in the air. Clearly one of the big things the studios are at is I think actually, even in the process of the strike, they've moved to a place where now they're like, we're actually not sure we like AI. Because we just realized that everyone can destroy our copyrights and use our material, right? And now they a significant part of the, AI themselves. Exactly. Yes, yeah. a significant yeah. part of the studio's brains now is going. Oh wait, we didn't think about that. Any kid on YouTube with AI is going to be able to make a Disney movie and put it on the internet, right? And right. and now they're like, um, oh, that's bad. And now <laughs> we are in some ways aligned about like, yeah, we both agree that the script I wrote for you, we should be benefiting from, and not some random AI. Um, so I think they have made moves. So I think there's a version of it where it's very quick. Right. Um, there's a thank you, TW. Uh, there's when there's trouble, you can call TW. Um, <laughs> but I, there's I think that there's a version of it that goes pretty quick. By the end of October, they're back to work, and then. But I got to tell you, man, this is we're in a, it's an interesting place. Normally in, in the Hollywood Thanksgiving to Christmas, everyone, nobody does anything. And I right. think this year people are going to be like, no, we're working. Yeah, we're fine. We'll do this. Because <laughs> end of October means you could have episodes up in the middle of December. Mm. That's so, great. I mean, people are working before that. But in terms of I, I, my friends and my sister and people who are like, well, when is Chicago Fire coming back? And when is NCIS coming back? And when is this coming? And you're like, eh, Thanksgiving-ish. If this yeah. thing gets done in October, because, you know, you can shoot an episode in f six to ten days mm -hmm. of a network show if you're really, I mean, but that's blazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's going to be, I think it's going to be interesting. There'll be episodes that were just like, we just had to get the episodes out. I think you're just going to see yeah. people blazing episodes out. But I think the other, there's another version that I hope doesn't happen where the AMPTP is wounded and mad and frustrated and they mm. decide to try to take it out on SAG. Yeah. Uh, and they underestimate how much SAG will fight. Because I think that SAG, and this shouldn't happen, but I think SAG is taken a little less seriously. Mm. You know, and it's like, oh, well, they're the silly actors and, the, and you know, and they're whatever. But they're fighting for their existential stuff too. I mean, they, they, they are asking for double the, min the wage increases that we got. They're asking for AI protections. You know, they're, you know, asking for you know some big big things and uh you know i don't i don't know how fast that will go i think um i i i think they'll have solidarity still from all of us i mean we're still we're going to be on their lines on monday and we will sure. be picketing with them and standing with them but but my hope is yeah that sometime between thanksgiving and christmas we have television back movies pick back up and we'll see what happens in terms of one thing that's really frustrating about it, tv executives is that if they've seen something a couple times, they think it's bad. Hmm. So, like, if you see a real, if they see a good script or a show, and then it's like, well, I saw that in April and I thought it was good, but now it's September and I'm like, it can't be good because I saw it in April. <laughs> yeah. And so, with that, I do have some, I, I just in terms of how projects are moving, uh, you know, I mean, you know, you might see some cancellations and some moves and some things like that, um, just as everybody gets stuff together. And, they took huge losses. I mean, they saved a lot of money by not making TV, but now is when the studios feel the pain because now is when the lag starts and they start yep. losing the ad money and they start getting hit. 
and that was their fault for for that strategy. But um, I don't know. I mean, they announced the X Men movie um, that they're they're looking for writers for the X Men movie, which will be an open pitch session, I assume, where just if you, your agent can get you in, you'll come in and essentially tell them what your idea would be and. You know, so I think they want to hit the ground running, and I know that rooms rooms that my friends are in or are running are starting up on Monday, so I think we'll be, be back soon, and we'll try to make that put pressure on. The hope is that that puts pressure on them to give SAG a deal. Right. Um, right. They're going to have con- they're going to have scripts ready to go and no money mm-hmm. to act in them, so they're going to... And that's my hope, too, because yeah. I think people have talked about, like, well, with us, it's like, well, should we, like, hold, withhold work or, you know, whatever in solidarity... But production is shut down whether we're writing or not. You right. know, we can. But when we write, we can have the town ready to go because so many people have, you know, been been hurting by this. So so yep. and IATSE and the Teamsters negotiate next year. So this could be a window where we just yep. need to get stuff done. Um, but no, it was. Uh, yeah, it, it, I, I hope they get what they got. I'm amazed at what we got. This is um, an incredible contract um, that that got every member of our union into it you know it got it got even soap opera writers to mm-hmm. game shows to late night to screenwriters to you know to episodic people and showrunners and everybody got something from this deal so that if you were out there marching for 148 days it was worth it that's fantastic fantastic yeah. last question for you before i let you go what can content creators like myself and other podcasters and youtubers do to help keep things moving along I mean, I think one of the things now is that it's it's so much more focused where, like, the writers can talk about projects they wrote, but they, writers who are in SAG are still, you know, there's there's all these things. But, but what people can do, I think, is, um, I think that this, it's, it's, it's good to learn about how we won and, and what the, pre- what that meant and the public pressure, because I can tell you from being inside the negotiating room, the public pressure on the studios matters a ton. They are because they need people to like them and like their stuff. So the pressure of that our guild wasn't going to break, their pressure of that everyone, when daytime shows tried to come back, everyone turned on the hosts, like all of this, to show that the tide isn't with them right, uh, is huge. And so I think with SAG, it's about continuing to stand with them and talking with them and working with them, and um, which is, I know it's hard because like even with Yubnub, we haven't talked about any new stuff still, yeah. and you know, and it is what it is. But I think the way to... Um, I think the way to be supportive are two big things is that is to if you have the ability to donate to places like the Entertainment Community Fund, the Green Envelope Fund, because these aren't going to like they are the nothing fancier. It's like literally we're buying groceries for people, yeah. for crew yeah. members, for, for and not just for actors, for crew members and lighting guys and focus pullers and, and PAs and interns who don't have uh, food, who don't have can't make rent. You know, just we're continuing to try to support them and then just keeping the public pressure up on the studios that every time they try BS, every time they try their PR thing, just being like, just give the actors a deal and we're done. Yeah. Yep. Again, it took four days of serious negotiating in the room to get our deal done. So if they meet on Monday, we could be done on Friday if they want to take it seriously. So I really I pray that they do. Well, excellent. Well, Greg, thank you so much for um, for me and Nick and Chris and and the people who listen to us. Um, this has been such great insight. Otherwise, I would have been just as confused as everybody else. And um, again, congratulations! And I can't wait till this is all done so we can all start talking about things. Make sure to check out Yubna Podcast with with Greg and some of his writer friends, and a great show that we love to listen to as well. But uh, Greg, thank you so much. Safe travels and congratulations once again. Thank you.